I don't think I've played this game since 1998. We wanted everything about the interface. We wanted had like no interface, so everything was was literal. Nothing was like a metaphor, because you know, in a, in a normal interface, the cursor is a metaphor for like your attention point, what you're looking at, and in the highlight of a cursor is kind of like a metaphor for this is interesting. And um, your inventory, your verbs when they come up are a, a metaphor for what you're thinking about doing to that object. And we want everything to be just literal. So like when you're walking around, instead of highlighting things in the room, he actually looks at the thing when that came up. And um, we thought we were so clever for thinking of that because there wasn't a lot of that in games at the time. Like 3D games were not a big thing yet. And um, so head tracking, even though all games head track now, like head tracking is a big, is really, really common now. It was not that common back then. But anyway, we thought we were totally geniuses for coming. Maybe we, maybe we were. Maybe we were geniuses. Um, but uh, we thought that was really cool. No, I think having so much time go by has allowed me to have a lot of time away from the game. And so it's very fresh to me. Like, I have not spent a lot of time with those characters in that game. It's been 15 years. I was talking to a friend of mine who had spent her summer up in Alaska with all these bikers, and she was telling me these stories about being in this bar with a uh, big Rick and smiling Phil, and and uh, the things they would do, and it just sounded so, um, you know, out of the normal daily experience of most people. Yet um, people were kind of familiar with it, kind of like pirates and cowboys. They kind of are familiar with the genre of bikers, and so they could relate to it. But it was still bigger than life, and it would be an unusual experience. When Full Throttle was over, it was a big hit, and they actually the studio wanted to make a sequel to it. They're like, let's do a sequel. And I was like, I, you know, now I really want to make this game about the Day of the Dead. There are stories about how when you died in Mexican folklore, you would be buried with a bag of gold on your chest and then another bag of gold hidden in the coffin um, that you were buried in so that when you went into the afterworld, uh, the spirits wouldn't, you know, steal the bag of gold. You know, it would be hidden in your coffin. As if this is the idea that you had to worry about Thieves in the afterlife was so interesting to me that you like you think that those problems would be gone. You're dead. You wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. But crime in the afterlife just seems so so in intriguing. And I was also really getting into film noir. At the time I was watching every film noir movie I could get my hand on, and um, going to film festivals and reading Raymond Chandler novels. And um, I mean, it was lucky that Full Throttle was a big hit because it was kind of a weird game to pitch. I want to do this game entirely comprised of dead people, you know, and I wanted to do that for years, and after Full Throttle was done, I guess because that game was a hit, I had a little bit of clout that I could make this crazy, weird, weird game. And uh, I was able to get Grim Fandango launched. As soon as we brought these two crazy elements together, film noir and Mexican folklore, it just, it was like one of those things that just sparked idea after idea after idea. And just whenever you hit something like that, it's so, so rare, you know, like you, um, sometimes you're just brainstorming, you're just like pulling teeth to have an idea of like how are we gonna, you know, like puzzles or rooms or locations or characters. It's so, such hard work sometimes to come up with ideas to fill in the framework of this thing you're making. But with Grimm, it just like, it was like a fire hose. Like we couldn't turn off. It was just such a um, explosion of um, ideas and creativity on that project, it was really fun. It was a lot of people we've been working with before, the lead artist, Pete Sakel. He had been um, an important person on Full Throttle, and he was setting a high bar for the standards of the, of the project. And Peter Chan, who had been working with us for a long time, you know, and he was just this amazing, you know, um, both creatively and also just um, the amount of work he produced. He just made drawing after drawing. It was all creative ideas, and he really pushed everybody and inspired everybody to just really push ourselves to do stuff that no one had ever seen before. Grimm is my favorite um, adventure game that I've ever worked on. And let me show you guys something. These are my family photo albums of when Tim and Pete Sakel came to visit and uh, used to do work jams on the island with me. And those are all the storyboards for Grim Fandango. And here's me drawing. I don't remember, but Tim swears that I was drawing so fast I was shooting the little ball tips out. It was the first time I had ever worked in 3D, and so we were coming up with, you know, putting together our first 3D art and animation team. Um, and then um, bringing together, like, Peter McConnell and his amazing music. 
years before, he had once, we, took, we were working at Data Tentacle, I think, and we were talking about dream projects. I remember he said, you know, the one thing we've never really done is like a noir jazz score. I would just always really love to do that. That's one thing that sat in the back of my head, and I was like, aha, now we're finally getting a chance to, to do that. And I think, you know, whenever you're getting a chance to do someone's dream project, they always kind of throw themselves into it. What I did to sort of envelop the game uh, musically was sort of, was go to the, um, the classic film score model, Max Steiner, um, John Williams. This is uh, the um, main title to Casablanca. It's a copy of the main title to Casablanca. It was a, a st score that I studied to work on Grimm. You know, there, in, in, in something like Grim Fandango, there are, there are sort of recognizable worlds with, with sort of little plums of, you know, this is sort of Central American city with a noir, um, you know, an art deco um, vibe to it. And this, this, is a, this is a dock like in the Maltese Falcon. This is the, um, this is the bell that, that I used for um, the harbor sounds in Grim Fandango. Um, Grim Fandango was definitely, you know, one of, uh, one of my favorite projects back in the Lucas days. And he really just threw himself into that and he just did, he did, I think, one of the greatest soundtracks ever. When, you, when you're working on, you're working on a new game right uh -huh. now. I mean, what is it you're trying to do? I mean, better graphics, better sound, better interface. What's, what's the, the sort of holy grail of gamers? Every game, we try to do more and more just um, a real story, a complicated story with a real human involvement. Like the, the new game I'm working on now, I try to do a, a story with just many more characters and uh, that spans a long period of time for mm -hmm. the characters' lives. It was, very, it was a really challenging project. It was very ambitious. It was like a year late. A year? and a half. I remember it took three years. Had a big crunch mode. It was back when crunch mode was pretty, well, a lot more, like now we really try hard not to have crunch mode, but at the time we're like, let's do it. Let's just work around the clock all the time. And I was working there. I would start writing like at nine o'clock at night and just write until three o'clock in the morning. I would listen to like loud, heavy metal music in my office just to stay awake. You know, you go home, you go to bed, just when you lay down to go to bed, you hear the garbage trucks coming in the morning, you're like, oh, people are just waking up and they're just trying to go to sleep, this is terrible. The team, like, by the end of it, didn't get along very well. Probably shouldn't mention that. It was just so, we were just all working too hard. And, um, yeah, we are just working everyone too hard. But it was an exciting time because we felt like we were making something special. We really felt like we were making something really crazy looking because we, we just stop, and every once in a while we would stop and take a look at the screen, and it'd be this skeleton with an orange face and a, like a Russian hat on, wearing a guard's uniform, standing in a sewer next to a Big Daddy Roth hot rod and a white alligator. And we'd be like, what is this thing we're making? This is insane. This is a crazy thing that no one has ever seen before. Yeah, we got to do whatever we wanted. And I think um, the management of LucasArts thought it was coming along, really, they, they really liked it. And they really thought it was, you know, being done really well and they were proud of it. At the time it wasn't perceived as doing, you know, selling very well, although it met its internal numbers, you know. It, had, it was, you know, it made a profit because I got a royalty check for it. So it did make a profit. But um, I think it, in the industry, I remember it was, it was used as evidence of why no one should make adventure games anymore. But, um, it, it, um, it won a lot of awards. I had won Game of the Year from GameSpot. That was awesome. Tim Schaefer on my right, game designer for over 10 years. He worked for LucasArts Entertainment where he designed Grim Fandango. And so I decided to start my own company. And that's when I left and started Double Fine. We started the company in 2000. Yeah, and started working on this game, kicking around ideas for Psychonauts. Oh, what's that doing there? <laughs> I feel like um, I, I, I own Grim Fandango and Throttle in every possible way except for legally and technically. And it's like I went to Disney and I'm like, you guys, come on. Um, you know, there's, there's not going to be many strategic plans around this. 
Uh, they're very valuable to us. We can make them even more valuable to you if we do something together on these. Um, and they were they were very receptive to that. So, so that's where we are. Um, it looks like Grimm's gonna happen and we're gonna re-release a, a remastered kind of um, version of it, so, with Sony. Um, so Tim and I met with Disney and Sony and uh, we're agreed on terms for Grim Fandango, so, yeah. And it happened, I couldn't believe we're actually here talking about it. Um, I'm excited that people might actually see the game after hearing about it for so long. It was in print for a while and then out of print and probably not reprinted and then it disappeared. And in the days of, um, you know, disc-based games, that was it. And then you just couldn't get it again. Um, you know, it's not like a digital game now where it could just stay online forever. It just vanished, you just couldn't find it. And it was so hard with those old disc-based games to keep them running, so it quickly became unplayable, wouldn't boot. People would have to, like fans, basically fans keep these things alive and support them for years, so it was really only the hard work of the fans that kept people able to play that game for years. But not just keeping them alive and playable, they're actually improving them. They made HD versions of the game, they made a point-and-click um, version of the interface, a uh, fix for some of the bugs in the game, they found some temporary programmer art that I was promised would never be found by my league programmer. They um, did a lot of stuff to make the old game um, run better and play better. And so it's really the grace of the fans that keeps these things running. We'd lie, we'd lie. I'd probably like to interface with the post-release community for Grand Bandango to utilize some of their enhancements. And this new version will hopefully take as much as we can of all that good stuff that's been done to Grim over the last 15 years and put it together. Because this, you know, we fought hard to get the right to be the ones to re-release this. And now we have to live up to that. You know what I mean? Because like, this could have been done by someone else. Um, and we have to prove that we were the ones to handle this correctly. So I don't want to take it for granted that I should get to do this because it was my game. But we know how to do this, you know, this new edition of it correctly.